welcome. They're still doing COVID-19 isolation. Don't have an audience in here. And we're trying to protect everybody. And some of these masks are kind of boring. So I thought I'd spice it up a little bit uh, by wearing my Jordanian kafia. This is from the uh, Royal Jordanian Army. God bless them all. Good, good folks. Welcome to the Scripture and Tradition program. And of course, I'm Father Mitch Pacwa. Um, having been over to the Middle East plenty of times, you pick up a few tchotchkes along the way. They don't call them tchotchkes, but I pick them up anyway. And this is uh, uh, kafia, and I get it's one of those things you can wear if you can figure out how to keep this on you. This is uh, help protect you from spreading the germs. So we are here to talk about scripture and tradition, and. We're going to continue to talk about the Eucharist. Now, in this program, we love to have you participate. Even if you don't know how to ride a camel, and if you don't have a kafia, you can still participate in this show. And, of course, we're talking about the live program, which is between 2 and 3 p.m. Eastern Time. And you can call the program during the live broadcast by call, if you're in North America, the phone number is 1-800-221-9460. 1-800-221-9460. If you are outside North America, you can uh, call another number, Again, country code 1, area code 205-271-2980. Wa is a biddak teki ba'arbi? Mumkin kamen. So we can have you call from a number of different places all around the world. And uh, we will put folks calling from outside the country ahead of everybody else. Now, you can also send questions or post comments via email or the social media pages. Um, the email is scriptureandtradition at ewtn.com or you can go online to facebook.com slash ewtn online or you can also go another place, YouTube dot com slash EWTN. You can see all that information on your screen and if you can see that and know what you're doing, um, which I don't always <laughs> when it comes to that social media stuff, um, you can send us your question. Now this Bible study is on the Eucharist and we are using a book that I wrote on the Eucharist called The Eucharist, a Bible study guide for Catholics. Now you can still get that book at EWTN's Religious Catalog. Go online to EWTNRC.com. It is item T1375. Today we will continue looking at the four narratives of the institution of the Eucharist. Three found in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke and one in the first epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 11. If you're following in the Eucharist book, we are star starting on page 37. I think the camera people are all safe enough, so I'll just remove my kafia. They wanted to make sure that there was no uh, danger to them. For coming from me, and at least not from any germs that I have. So, we're starting to go through the uh, material on the, um, uh, the institution of the Eucharist. And there's a second element that we want to do, a third element, I should say, sorry. This is the importance of the blood of the new covenant. That's the blood of Jesus Christ 
but he himself identifies it as the blood of the new covenant. And so we see that phrase, especially in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25, where St. Paul wrote, and remember, 1 Corinthians is the first description of the institution of the Mass. It comes before the Gospels by a little bit. And says there, in the same way, Jesus also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We'll get to the remembrance part uh, next week, I think. Um, but now we want to take a look just at the covenant. And then remember, St. Luke traveled with St. Paul for a number of years. Uh, first, uh, when he uh, met St. Luke in Asia Minor before he went to Corinth. And then later on, he picked him up again in 58 A.D., so they would, have, they would have met probably around 50, uh, actually about 50, about the year 50. And he left St. Luke behind in um, Philippi. And then he picks him up again in the spring of 58 to go to the Holy Land. And then St. Luke spends from the spring, probably about uh, April of 58, all the way into the year 62. So we see here that St. Luke writes that Jesus did the same with the cup after the supper, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Okay? So uh, there's that similarity between the two of them. Now, this all goes back to roots in the Old Testament. That's the origin here. And we can find this in the book of Exodus, chapter 24. Now, remember, in chapter 20, Moses received the tablets with the Ten Commandments. And then there are a series of other laws that are also given. At the end of receiving those laws, Moses goes down from the mountain and meets the people, and he reads to them the law. They said, everything that the Lord has said we will do. In other words, he reads the text of the law in those chapters 20 through 23. And he lets them know this, and they immediately respond, everything that the Lord has said we will do. Now, this is important because you see already here that the people are including the reading of sacred scripture in the sacrificial ceremony in the Old Testament. And they also respond, just like we do at Mass when we say at the end of the Eucharistic prayer, Amen. This is a faith response. Everything that the Lord has said, we will do. Moses read it again to everybody to make sure that they heard it and understood it, and they say it again. Everything that the Lord has said, we will do. Then, in Exodus 24, verse 5, we see that he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed oxen, as well as offerings of well-being to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood from the oxen, that is, half of the blood, and put it in basins, and half of the blood he dashed against the altar. Now, this is something that is very significant, because when it says that Moses poured the blood into basins <coughs> and half of it he put on the altar. Here's the idea. He's going to sprinkle the people with 
that blood that's in the bowls. And then the rest of the blood goes on the altar. I don't know if all of you did this when you were a child, um, and I certainly did with my friends, where you become blood brothers. In other words, you make a little cut, just a little one, and two guys will mix their blood together and say that they're brothers, okay? That's kind of the idea that the blood of the bull on the altar symbolizes the blood that goes to the Lord. Now, God is infinite and he doesn't really have blood, but this is a symbol, okay? Treat it as such. Understand them from their own world. And then the other half he'll put on them. That's kind of the idea. Now, the word that is used in the Greek translation of this text, the Septuagint, is the same verb that Jesus used when he says that his blood is poured out for the many. It's the verb encheo, encheo. So just as Moses poured out the blood of the oxen into the bowls, Jesus talks about his precious blood in the cup and the chalice as being poured out. And this is one verbal connection immediately between the institution of the Eucharist and the, this ceremony of the covenant in Exodus 24. Then we go on in verse uh, 8, chapter 24, verse 8 of Exodus. It says that Moses took the blood and dashed it on the people. He sprinkled the people and said, See the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Now notice that phraseology. That in the Old Testament, the covenant is at Sinai. This is one of a number of covenants in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, testament means covenant. So, uh, and you use the word in Hebrew when you talk about the New Testament, Old Testament, you talk about the um, berit hadasha uh, is the new covenant. And the berit is the word for covenant. And they don't really call it the Old Testament because for Jewish people it's the one testament. So they just talk about it as the Torah, prophets, and writings. But when we speak of it, it's Old Covenant, the Old Testament. And in Mount Sinai, they make this covenant. Remember, there had been a covenant uh, with Noah, not to flood the earth, a covenant with Abram, uh, that he would have children and land. Another covenant with Abram, when he circumcised himself and his men, and in that covenant, you know, that he's going to have his name changed. And then there's this covenant at Mount Sinai, and he pronounces, this is the blood of the covenant. At the Last Supper, Jesus, our Lord, also says, this is the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. So this is talks about, and we'll talk about that in a second, but it's very important to understand. In the Old Testament, it was 12 bulls, one bull from each tribe, and their blood was sprinkled on the people. As they said, this is, uh, the, the behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you. And that it's, the Old Covenant is sealed with the blood of a sacrifice. That's very important. But in the New Testament, instead of the external sprinkling of blood on the bodies of the people, the blood of oxen that were slain, oxen that they owned, but still oxen only, at that point that Jesus in the New Testament gives us his own blood, not the blood 
of bulls, but his own blood. And again, unlike the bull, which has no say-so in the matter, he has no decision, he doesn't offer himself up for a sacrifice. If he could think about it, which he can't, uh, he would probably say no. That's the way animals are. I don't blame them. But Jesus offers himself willingly. And this already indicates that by saying that this is the blood of the new covenant, that our Lord is very much beginning this covenant with a sacrifice. In other words, this is another component by which we can understand the words of Jesus to mean that the Eucharist is a sacrifice. I know a lot of people say this is a, uh, a meal together, a, a meal for the community to make us one. Yeah, there's that element. But it is first a sacrifice. And just as in the Old Testament, they then cooked the 12 oxen and they ate the meat. So also we share a meal and, and the Eucharist is, has that meal element, but it is secondary. First, it is a sacrifice and it is a sacrifice that begins a new covenant with God. That is the emphasis. And in our own day and age, when so many people want to emphasize what we are doing to build up our own community, we very much need to remember that this is something where God changes wine into his own blood and does this in a sacrificial way connected to Calvary. And he does so so that he is ultimately the one who forms us into community. We don't form ourselves. We cooperate with the graces God gives us. But God, our Lord, is the one who underlies the meaning of the Eucharist. And more importantly, it is God himself who underlies the real power of the Eucharist to bring us into this covenant. And when you see that, then you can understand John 6. And we're going to go into John 6 in a later chapter. But for now, I want to already bring this in. What does our Lord say in John 6, 53? Truly, truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life. And I will raise them up on the last day, for my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Why can he make that promise? Because the power of eating his flesh and drinking his blood comes from this new covenant. And it is a requirement for us to remain in Jesus, to remain in eternal life, we need to receive his body because it is his body and blood that bring us into this new relationship. Just like when you get married, marriage is a covenant relationship. And when you get married, you get a whole new set of relationships, not only with your spouse, but with the whole community of their family and they with yours. So also here, we can have eternal life because we receive the body and blood of Christ that he offers in a sacrifice that is the basis and the source of power for this new covenant that we call the Christian life. All right, we're going to take a break. I want to go on and take a few new elements of this, develop it a little bit further, so please stay with us.
right now, there's one more element about this that I want to deal with, and I introduced it at the beginning. This idea of the new covenant. Where does that come from? You have to understand the Old Testament because during the, the 590s and 580s BC, the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel began their ministry. Actually, Jeremiah had begun earlier, about 30 years earlier, so he was already an old man. Ezekiel was a younger man. And they prophesy. And one of the things that Jeremiah says, let me quote this to you from Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 9. Again, the Lord said to me, there is revolt among the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They have turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers, who refused to hear my word. They have gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. So he's talking about the covenant at Mount Sinai. He declares it broken. Likewise, in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 59, it says, Thus says the Lord God, I will deal with you as, I have, as you have done who have despised the oath by breaking the covenant. So both of them, and there are a couple of the passages in which both of them decree that Israel broke the covenant at, from Sinai. That's the one they're talking about. Not the covenant with Abraham, but the covenant at Mount Sinai is broken because the covenant with Abraham was an unconditional covenant. But the covenant at Mount Sinai was a conditional covenant. You see, for instance, in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 26 and 27, that if you break these laws, here are the curses you're going to get. If you keep the laws, here are the blessings you'll get. Okay? So they were warned about it. And Moses again warned them in chapters 28, 29, and 30. Don't swerve to the left or to the right, but stay straight ahead on the commandments of God. Okay? They did it. And that's why the priest Jeremiah, who was a prophet and a priest, and the priest prophet Ezekiel, both of them were priests and prophets, and they both proclaimed, you broke the covenant, it's done. And then in 380, excuse me, in 587 B.C., the Babylonians come into the city of Jerusalem. They destroy the city, take the people captive, and they burn the temple. And that was sort of the seal, the, act, the, the activity seal to that prophecy. The covenant's over. I'm destroying your holy city and your temple. It's done. Now, that wasn't the end of the story because after the temple was destroyed, both Jeremiah and Ezekiel promised that there would be a new covenant. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, which they broke, even though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and they will write it upon their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So that's the new covenant. And then likewise, in Ezekiel 37, verse 26, Ezekiel prophesies, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them. I will bless them and multiply them, and my sanctuary will be in the midst of them forever. So 
Both prophets said the covenant was over, but once the punishment was done, they didn't say, see, I told you so, you got what you deserve. No, no, no. The prophets do not do that. Foolish people and children, often the same, they do that, but not the prophets. No, the Lord speaks to them and says, I'll give them a new covenant. Now, here's the interesting thing. No place in the Old Testament says, oh, we got the, old, we got the covenant renewed. No prophet after Ezekiel or Jeremiah over the next 575 or 80 years, nobody said that we got a new covenant. There was no re-establishment of the new covenant. didn't happen. And neither do we see anywhere in the Mishnah, which is the collection of the sayings of rabbis, or the Talmud, which is a, a later collection of the sayings of rabbis from after Mishnah is done. So Mishnah is done in the year 200, and then from 200 A.D., to 450 A.D., there are more sayings that are written down in Talmud. They also don't speak about the covenant being reestablished. The only one to ever mention that the new covenant is being established is Jesus Christ our Lord. And the only place where he announces this new covenant is at the Last Supper, as he institutes the Eucharist, as he says over the cup of wine, this is the chalice of the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. Using the words of Jeremiah and Ezekiel that had prophesied a new and everlasting covenant, Jesus Christ fulfills at Holy Mass. And this is one more absolutely key component to understand the meaning of the Eucharist, that you have to see this as that new covenant. Um, this is what Christ our Lord does. Okay? All right. Now, there's still a lot more going on in the Eucharist. We see another phrase that Jesus speaks immediately after he consecrates the bread and the wine. He says, do this. Now, this is a plural imperative. As we would say here in the South, y'all do this. Get her done. You, but it's saying to all the apostles present, do this. And we'll get to remembrance later on. Now, this is another phrase that doesn't just mean act on it. It means offer it as a sacrifice. Now, we don't use it, the, the phrase do this to mean offer sacrifice. But the Old Testament does again and again and again and again. And I want to go through some of those verses. If we don't get through them all today, we'll continue on next week. In all languages, when we say do this, the, it has all kinds of uh, meaning. Do is just one of those words that has a wide range of meaning. But we see that it is used for sacrifice in the Old Testament. For instance, in Exodus chapter 10, verse 25, when Moses meets with Pharaoh for the last time and says to Pharaoh, um, you must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings to sacrifice to the Lord our God. Okay? Now, here's the, the interesting thing. When it says the word sacrifice, let us sacrifice, 
it is the Hebrew word asinu, asinu, that we may do, okay? And this is something that uh, we see that the, uh, it's translated correctly as um, sacrifice, but when they translated it into Greek, in the Septuagint, they use the word poesomen, we do. Poeo means I, we, I do. So poesomen, we do. And, but when it was translated into Latin by St. Jerome in the Vulgate, he used the word offeramus, let us offer. Now, the Greek is being literal, translating the word do. But St. Jerome gives that proper meaning to it. And there are lots and lots of other places where this is done. One of the most interesting is when they, Moses uses the word do in reference to the sacrifices at the ordination of his brother Aaron and Aaron's sons as priests. Now, you can find that in Leviticus 8 and 9. And here's why it's so interesting for us, is that the church understands our Savior's words, do this, offer, in other words, offer this, sacrifice this. That would be a legitimate translation. And it's used at uh, as a term by which Jesus our Lord ordains the 12 apostles, including Judas Iscariot. He's still there. As you see in Luke 22, Judas does not depart until after the Eucharist. Absolutely clear in that text. So he departs after the Eucharist. He was also ordained a bishop. And we understand that our Lord's words do this, offer this, as the ordination of the 12 apostles as bishops. But it's also very important to note that when Moses ordains Aaron and his sons as priests, he has to offer a number of, of sacrifices, a sin offering bull, uh, two rams, unleavened bread, anointing oil, and all. And he has to do all this. But they distinguish between when he slaughtered the animals, Vayishchat, versus doing the sacrifice. So he does the sacrifice, and it is not an accident that our Lord uses this sacrificial terminology that is used at the ordination of the priests of the Old Covenant. He uses exactly the same words when he institutes the ordination of priests of his New Covenant, namely the Twelve Apostles. And so this is extremely important. Well, look, we have folks trying to get through and with, with calls, so let's go take a look at some of the calls and people that people have. And let's start off with Dan. Dan, where are you calling from? From Iowa, Father. Oh, good. how are things in your area of Iowa? I've, I, I've heard that there's been some hot spots of the pandemic. Some. There yes, some not the, many, but a few. In the, in the larger cities. Or, right, and uh, in the packing yeah. plant, too. Yeah, we have yeah. that, too. Yeah. That, that's yeah. the one that made the news. So we'll keep, yeah. keep everybody in Iowa very much in our prayers. What can we do for you today, Dan? Well, I, I, we're calling you and talking about the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And it, I don't know if you want to call it silver or money or not, but when, during this pandemic... I have not been able, we have not been able to partake in the Holy Communion. And I'm developing a strange, uh, like in my heart and my soul, a hunger that I mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't have before. You know, I, I knew the, 
the presence was always there when it went to mass and everything. Mm-hmm. And I guess maybe taking it for granted or what, but I have a renewal. I'm feeling a, a tr- true hunger mm-hmm. for for uh, uh, Jesus in the sacrament. And even though I do participating uh, mass on BEWDN and spiritually, but there's just I can feel something in my heart mm-hmm. that is missing that I didn't have before this pandemic. And a, a, a question maybe for you mm-hmm. and the rest of your audience is if, uh, if you've been hearing if people have been uh, uh, giving that or asking you that or telling you that. Sure. As a matter of fact, Dan, I see this. I, as a matter of fact, something I said at the very beginning of the pandemic is that these kind of crises will make the good people even better and it'll make the not so good people or the bad people even worse. Some people will act better, some will act worse. We keep hearing lots and lots of stories in all sorts of realms of life where some people whose restaurants are closed are using the restaurants to feed doctors and nurses. We also hear about a tremendous increase of drug overdoses, suicide, and uh, and child abuse and abuse of spouses in the home. A crisis brings out what we're like. And I have heard what you said from a number of people, Dan, that their hunger for the Eucharist has gone, it's like they're going through a fast. And as they fast from the Eucharist, they are experiencing a greater desire. Well, there have been some people who said, man, I didn't realize it's sort of nice just to be free on Sunday morning and uh, just sort of sit around in your uh, pajamas all day and not do get up for church and get dressed and stuff. So it helps to divide people. And where that comes into play for you and me and everybody else, how are we going to respond to this crisis and any other crisis that comes? Are we going to let the crisis turn us into better people? Or are we going to take the route of coasting downhill into stasis that makes us worse? That's the question. And uh, people are taking both routes. And it sounds like you're doing the, 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 the tougher but the better route. And let's pray that more people join us in this process of trying to become better through the crisis. All right. We're going to take a break. Be back in just a couple minutes, so please stay with us. We are back uh, talking about the Holy Eucharist, and we have another caller online. David, where are you calling from? Hey, Father Mitch, I'm calling from uh, Richardson, Texas, up here at St. Paul the Apostle in Richardson. Well, aren't you something? Yes, sir. Oh, Uh, it's good to uh, hear from you. Yes, sir. Uh, Father, uh, I I proctor a Bible study up there at the church, and I was wondering, a lot of people ask me this, is the Mass the the sacrifice on Calvary, or is it the celebration of the Last Supper? Mm. And I kind of tell them it's it's both. You know. Good for you. Is you that right? think <laughs> like a theologian. I like you better already. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. So no, that's exactly right. Why is that? Do, 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 how do you explain it to them? 
from what I understand and what I what I read and stuff is that um, is that it's a process. The mass is it's leading up to, it's, you know, it's the Last Supper and then mm -hmm. the broken Christ when the mm -hmm. Eucharist is broke, broken up there. Well, let me give you another theological concept that may help just refine that a little bit. If you keep in mind that Jesus Christ is the Word of God made flesh, correct? And that the Word was God, and He was in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we see that Jesus Christ is described many times as God. And there's a lot more to that, but that's enough to start. Because he, he is God and man, it's very important that we pay attention to um, his timelessness. This is something that we see is essential to God. God does not have time. Jesus humbled himself and entered into time when he became flesh. But his divine nature always stayed eternal and therefore has no time. So for God, the Last Supper is always in the present. The crucifixion is always in the present. And today at Mass is always in the present. God does not have a past that he loses or forgets. He can't. It's his nature for everything to be right now forever present to him. And so there is, it's, that's, that's why it's the same reality that the death of Jesus Christ on the cross his sacrifice on the cross, which is what we talked about in chapter 1 of this book, that that sacrifice is eternally available. That's why sometimes uh, you, people will say to us, non-Catholics will say, well, why do you Catholics crucify Jesus again and again? We don't. We don't. No more do we crucify Jesus again and again then do evangelicals crucify Jesus again and again every time they proclaim, I have had my sins washed away in the blood of the Lamb. Did they have to kill Christ again? No. They believe that the eternal presence of Jesus' crucifixion is something that goes beyond time. What is forever now for them becomes now in that moment of faith when they believe that their sins are washed away. And we believe that when we go to confession, and we also believe it when we receive the body and blood of Christ in the Eucharist, that what is always eternally present to God becomes present to us in that moment by the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Word of God, all of which we're going to go into in later parts of this. But to see right now, that there is absolute unity in the Mass, the Last Supper, the crucifixion, because it is all Jesus in his divine eternity being present to us in these ways. And that's the key. All right? All right, let us now go over to Maureen. Maureen, where are you calling from? Worcester, Massachusetts. Oh, I've been there. You have? I have a few times. Uh, oh my God! And I, I didn't even see you. you. Did you meet? Did you meet Monsignor Scollins? I don't remember. I met the bishop. Father Scollins. He's yeah. like, but, well, he's a Monsignor, but I. Well, they I send. Know. They don't send Monsignors to keep an eye on me. They send bishops. They try to run herd on me and keep control. So it needs a bishop. Oh God, he is <laughs> outstanding, Father Scollins. So, he is. So best. what can we do for you? Well, first I want to do something for you. I was a social worker, so I kind of have a different thinking on it. I want to give you feedback on yourself 
that I find you outstanding, and I really appreciate you sharing all this knowledge, you know, and you back it up and you cite it. And, you know what I mean? Like, I, I find you very thorough. Well, thank you. That's very you, kind. You know, huh? that's, that's why my superiors sent me to the 27th grade. So I would Fun. finally get something to learn and then have something to do with my life. Well, you're doing a great job. Thank I'll tell you, you that much. Thank you. And, I, you know, I just say, like I said, I was a social worker. I had hundreds of clients, and I had hardly any feedback. No one ever, you know, I, a couple of people let me know sure. that I helped them. But I didn't get a lot, so I don't know if you get a lot. You probably do get more than I got. Yeah, I just felt the need to communicate that to you. I well, really thank appreciate you. it. And I'll bet you had a more hurting clientele. You know, people... I had a very, a very sad. I was yeah, uh, working yeah. in the welfare department. But sure. actually, it was like a blessing because I found the poor know <laughs> a better way to live than the rich. Sometimes. And I, I really, I really but, think that's But we true. have to... I'd like to get to your question, if we could, because I just All have right, a few I, minutes I like left. To I want to give a short All right, my, shift. My, all right, my question is, like, I'm a Roman Catholic, cradle Catholic, you know, mm -hmm. so I, I don't take special recognition. You know, it's kind of easy in that mm -hmm. respect because everyone believes so thoroughly, mm -hmm. deeply. Uh, but my question is, I am a divorced woman, mm -hmm. and I have read about G Jesus what he teaches about divorce, mm -hmm. and I, I get very angry at him, and I mm -hmm. let him know it, mm -hmm. but I, I, I feel he knows it anyway, you know, mm -hmm. he'd rather hear the truth from me than me pretending I'm not mm -hmm. angry. Mm -hmm. I don't like my anger, but I don't appreciate his teachings on divorce, because mm -hmm. I feel like he totally is siding with men, mm -hmm. giving them, like, permission to go on with their life. And the woman, like me, who I love, my husband, he mm -hmm. divorced me. We yeah. were married for 20 years. We uh, were together for 26, 26 years, I've known him. Mm -hmm. And he's off with a new wife and a new life. And mm -hmm. I'm alone. And I right. suffer a lot. But I do, you know, I don't like what Jesus wrote about. Maybe you can give me some insight on it. But I feel like uh, he really was very yeah. biased towards men. Let me give a, a couple points. Um, first of all, in the, uh, the, the rabbinic law was divided. You had uh, one group, um, the, the House of Hillel, which was a very important school. And according to them, if your wife burns the carrots, that's grounds for divorce. Okay? Whereas in... The, um, uh, the, the House of Shammai, uh, they were very strict in limiting divorce. And Jesus actually took the stricter approach. Secondly, that the divorce was at the, uh, the, the norm, that divorce was at the decision of the husband, not the wife. So he's reflecting that. He's not favoring men. In fact, if you look at the legislation from, from these perspectives, he is warning men that if you divorce and get remarried, you are committing adultery. Now, you see a little bit differently. Now, again, when St. Uh, Matthew wrote his gospel, he's primarily addressing a Jewish community, but St. Mark includes that the, the, it applies equally to men and women because he was writing for Gentiles in Rome, as was St. Luke, and they bring out that you can, uh, either the woman or the man, has equal responsibility for initiating a divorce and trying to prevent it. So you have to take a look at it in terms of the, the law at those times and the difference of law in the two different parts of the Mediterranean world. Jewish people, only men could initiate it. What you may want to do is take a look <coughs> at one of the uh, more detailed um, commentaries 
Here's one by um, the, the word Bible commentary. You get a lot more detail on that background for those passages, and you'll see that it's actually warning men not to get a divorce because they are liable to be uh, called adulterers, which means they are liable to go to hell uh, for, for initiating just, I don't like my wife, I'm leaving. So he was actually fairly strict to the men, okay? Uh, but it's more that I can get into in detail here. Uh, let me take one more caller. And Ron, uh, you're in Michigan, is that right? I'm in Kalkaska, Michigan, Father, okay. yes. Okay, great. And what's your question? This morning's reading, they talked about the Jews stoning Paul and trying to kill him. Mm -hmm. Earlier on, they stoned uh, Stephen mm -hmm. and murdered him. Right. And yet at uh, Jesus' trial in front of Pilate, the mm -hmm. Jews said that they were not allowed to tr uh, kill Jesus right. because they, uh, it was against the uh, Jewish law. Sure. Why, was, why could they kill people by stoning and yet not Jesus? The difference is in the timing. That when our Lord was put on trial, who was the judge that decided death? Pontius Pilate, correct? And Pontius Pilate made that decision. However, in the year 36 AD, Pontius Pilate let a number of his cavalry attack a group of Samaritans. They were following their own Messiah. And he let his cavalry attack them, and there was a fairly significant slaughter. To answer to that, the emperor Tiberius ordered him to come back to Rome to answer charges of misconduct of his administration. So while he was gone, the Jewish high priests had control of the situation. And that's when the persecution against Stephen and then Paul having that kind of authority to go and do his persecution, that happened in 36 AD while Pilate was gone. And by the way, on his way to Rome, the emperor Tiberius died so he didn't get charged with anything. Um, Tiberius' successor was Caligula, and he didn't exactly lead such a good life that he'd be that critical of a few deaths. So that's what happened there, okay? Two different circumstances. All right, may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May he lead you in all of your ways by his peace. May God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And again, remember, this network is brought to you by you. That's how our Lord Jesus inspired Mother Angelica to establish it. So in these times, even though it's a little tight, if you could, please keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill. We'll pay all of our bills. And now it's time for me to get back out there in the COVID world. Thank you.